good afternoon everyone so, unlike most of you i am from the industry i am working as an engineering manager in grab uh, i think most of you have already experienced grab and <laughs> and uh, because we are in the news also recently because we knocked out uber from southeast asia so <coughs> here today i am going to talk about my recent experience uh, i wrote couple of books for students to learn data structures and algorithms and one was using c and one was using python so about me as i mentioned i am working as an engineering manager in grab and for the last 10 years apart from my engineering career i also in my free time try to do something for the education especially in bangladesh because i feel that we are lagging behind in many areas so i i wrote a few books in bangla those are involved uh, in c, using c python scratch and couple of books are actually free for the students to read in the websites the cp book is c programming book and py book is python book and i also create a lot of video tutorial series in youtube which i am also continuing to do and i have one blog this one in, uh, is written in bangla shumin.com and this love python i used to blog about python in 2007 2008 when i started learning python nowadays i don't get time much to write in this blog and i also worked as a trainer and also organizer of bangladesh mathematical olympiad so today i am going to talk about i mean my experience of using python to implement data structure and algorithms and the key points here are the simplicity and i also talk about the dangers i mean what are the disadvantages or what we should be careful about when we are teaching uh, algorithms or data structures using python and also what are the advantages and lastly we can discuss about actually what should we use in the class so let's uh, jump into some code examples for example i i think all of you know that okay stack is a very fundamental and easy data structure which is last in first out so a student who is already familiar with python who knows uh, data structure called list he can easily come up with this kind of code right that okay there should be three functions push pop and is empty and if you just use the append function with the list you can append an item and if you can use the pop function to pop an item and that's it but if you want to do it a, a better way i think in a previous presentation i also saw that okay because in engineering we want to do things in an object oriented way okay you can come up with this class so this thing is very simple and beautiful and easy right i mean there is not much to discuss about anybody who who, who has a one week experience of python can read the code and understand but so if inspired by the simplicity or beauty okay we, if we move into the next data structure say queue and we again do similar implementation using lists so for n queue we use the app, append function and for d queue we use the pop function but this time the difference is we are popping from the front so this is simple it does what a queue is supposed to do but it's extremely inefficient so what happens when you pop from the beginning of a list actually the item gets removed and all the items behind uh, following that item are shifted on space so this is a problem while teaching with python i mean if you don't make it very clear to the students the students may take it for granted okay it might they may think that this is a order of one operation which it is not so this thing we need to be careful about when we are demonstrating any algorithm or data structures in python because the complexity concept can get messed up but we can do a better job in queue if you if we do a circular queue then we can come up with this beautiful class but if you look i am not sure whether you can see the code but if you look closely the code now mostly looks like c because there is not much pythonic thing here so sometimes we may need to get into this kind of details to show the students actually what you need to do to build something useful that is really usable so this q class is more usable than the previous code example i i just 
should. And here one thing is the queue is limited by its max size. When we create this circular queue, we need to first guess whether there should be 100 item or 1000 items or 10,000 items. <coughs> and in this part of the code, say when the queue is full, we just declare the queue, e queue is full and return and we do not do anything. In Python, actually what you can do here is to extend your space. Say we are using items, uh, a list name items for holding the items. So, you can actually extend the items in a very easy way, just using the extend function and you also then need to change these two lines to uh, ensure that the program is working correctly. But if you are to implement this using C, then you need, it, you need to do some dynamic memory allocation, memory deallocation, all this kind of stuff, which sometimes are scary to the students if they are not very familiar with the C and other concepts. So, now let me show you some uh, another example of uh, benefit of using Python in teaching algorithms. So, in industry, we are very uh, religious about unit tests. We say so this is uh, something we must do. So, any kind of code we write, any functions we write, that must be accompanied by unit tests. So, for example, you have a sorting, uh, implemented a sorting algorithm in any, say, in a whatever sort it is, maybe it is a quick sort, march sort, heap sort, does not matter. So, we can write this kind of test cases. For example, okay, if this is the input 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, which is already sorted in ascending order, then what is the expected output? The expect, expected output should be the same, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Then there is another test case, if the input is random, like 3, 4, 1, 2, the uh, expected output is 1, 2, 3, 4. So, this is reversed or reverse order like 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Expected output is it's still 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And here, uh, edge case like, okay, sorting with only one item, what is the expected output? Expected output is uh, the same item. So, then in Python, what we can do is we loop through the loop over the test cases, and for each test case, we can check using an assert that whether the expected list that we are expecting is matched with the sorted list we got using that function. And if it does not match, then it will give you an error, which I can show you from the screen. For example, here I have an implementation of mart sort. Now, to understand that or to make myself understand that, okay, whatever I have implemented is uh, working. So, what I can come up with some test cases and then I just run So, using pytest, I can just run pytest and then the file name and it is it giving that okay, one passed in 0 0.04 seconds. So, the test case is passed. So, what if, if I make some mistake and say the result here was instead of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, it, if it is 1, 2, 3, 4, 4, then you see the, uh, the test failed and it also tells me that where it is failing that assert 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, it does not match where at index 4 and the difference is this 4 is not equal to 5. So, it tells me that my code is incorrect and where it, it went wrong. So, why we should use this in the class? Because <coughs> while teaching or learning data structure and algorithm, I have seen some students while I was volunteering in different places that, okay, they understand how the data structure works or they claim that they understand how this algorithm works, but they cannot implement because they are not fluent in coding. And even if they can implement, sometimes there can be bug in their implementation, there can be edge cases, which can be easily caught using unit tests. And as this is very important for the, especially if they are in the industry, then it is very, I think it is very good thing if they can build the habit when they are fresh, when they are learning the programming. So, 
as I said, whatever sorting algorithm it is, if you are using unit tests, then it can actually make them confident, okay, my algorithm, whether my implementation is working or not. Now, let me come to an, another example, like building a heap. So, on the left side, we can see a complete binary tree here, and on the right side, it's uh, converted to a heap, and which is max heap. So, max heap means here the any node is greater than both of his child. So, here 19, I see that, okay, this is greater than 10 and 17, 17 is greater than 12 and 1. So, how Python can help implementing a heap? Here, actually, Python does not have anything special compared to C or Java or even any other languages like Perl. So, the algorithm is the same, but there are some advantages if you use Python to do this. Because when you implement a heap, there are a lot of functions that you need to implement, like these small functions like calculating, calculating the position of left child, right child, parent, then max heapify, and then build max heap. And then if you want to, so I think I need to. Sorry, so here is the code. So, as I said that there are a lot of functions to implement. If you are going to implement a simple data structure like heap, that this left, right parent, they find the index of the left child, right child, and the parent, and there is max heap by function, and then build max heap. And then if you want to sort it, then you need to implement heap sort. If you want to use it as a priority queue, then you need to implement extract max. So, there are a lot of functions to implement. And we must make sure that our implementation is correct from in all the functions. If we make any mistake, like okay, for for example, if instead of two into i plus one, I write two into i minus one. If I make some minor mistake, the whole thing will be jeopardized and went wrong. It will go wrong. So how we can make sure that our implementation is correct? So, every time we write a function, I did not show it for the left, right or parent. For example, when I wrote the max cp by function, I must know that what I expect this function to do. Then what I can do is just below I can write another function called text, test max cp phi with my test cases and here using assert I make sure that the expected thing is matching with what I am getting. And Similarly, for, for build max heap, I can also have a function called test build max heap. For heap sort, I can also have a function like test heap sort. I didn't write the code here. It will be very similar to the sorting test I sh uh, I shown earlier. And same with extract max max. I can write a test for e extract max max. So when I write unit test for every function in the code, and if all the unit tests pass, it means that my code is very less likely to go wrong unless I choose the test cases very casually. If I am very careful and particular about choosing the test cases, then I can be confident that okay, my code will work. So, one thing is unit test, but there is another beautiful thing I would like to show you, which is to visualize the trees. Because when I am talking about heap, and I am putting things in list or array like this. So, it's, it may be very difficult to visualize, but using some Python libraries, I can easily do it. Now, if I run this code, see th this is the before building heap, this is, the, this is my tree, and after building heap, this is my tree. So, here Python is also useful, right? I mean, instead of just uh, showing the students array or list or linear data, if you can simply build something like uh, something like this, so they can visualize what is happening and what change actually happened that, okay, the largest item 19, it went to, went to the top. So, I think this could be very helpful for the students when they are working with this and trying to learn. So, the last example I would like to show is a linked list. So, we all know that okay, in linked list, we have a head pointer and there are nodes like here I see three nodes and no, each node has two parts. One is 
data and another second part is the pointer to the next item, right? So, and in the third item where the data is C, there is a cross sign, it means it does not have any more pointers, so the linked list ends here. So, when I use C to implement linked list, it is quite intuitive like, okay, I create a node structure because none of the default data type or built in data type will help as each data has two parts. One part is the no node part or uh, data part and another part is the pointer part which points to the next item. That is why I needed to create a structure which is a data and pointer to the next item. And what kind of pointer it is? It is something node type. So, what is node type? I have already defined that struct node is can be considered as a node. And thus, if I want to create a node, then what I need to do is allocate memory using this malloc function and how much memory I need, which is the size of node and uh, node type. And if the memory allocation fails, which is say new node is null, it means somehow the system or the compiler failed to allocate the memory, then I can give an error message and exit. And if the memory allocation is successful, this will be false, then I can put the item in the data part and put the next node pointer here to the next part and return the new node. But while I implement it in C and Python, things become very simple. I can just e create a node class with data and next and thus you do not need to deal with pointers and dynamic memory allocation. And if you do allocate memory dynamically, then you also need to free those. So, here is the near node creation part. Node is, is a node is an object where I pass the data in to initialize and the current node dot next can be node. But here I see a problem which is whenever I teach or want to teach linked list maybe in my in a written form or in a lecture. So, an item must point to the next item, but here it is very difficult to explain because I am assigning node to here which is actually binding its name. So, if I use code like this here, I can actually draw in the table that ok. So, this is your data part and this is the pointer part and this node pointer next which is actually a pointer to a node struct. So, it is very intuitive if somebody is actually uh, familiar with C, but being familiar with Python, I do not find this linked list in implementation very intuitive because this is very difficult, uh, difficult to explain or difficult to internalize as a student. So, when I learn data structure and, and algorithm, I use C in my university, but later when I started learning Python and started playing with some data structures to implement, then this does not uh, sound very intuitive to me and thus I do not think that it is always a good idea to throw everything in Python because we must know the limitations where we cannot explain things clearly in Python and then we need to put some extra effort to clarify things to the students. Now, the final discussion, what should we use in the classroom? Actually, I do not know, it depends on the teacher, <laughs> whoever is teaching, he will decide what, sh what should the teacher what she will use in the classroom, but it, I think it depends on the purpose, I mean why the students are learning it, why I am teaching this class, I, are they high school students, are they college students, are they university students or self learner and also the motivation for the students, I mean how much effort they are going to put on this course or how much uh, time they are going to willing to spend to learn all these things and also how prepared they are, how much python they know. If they have python experience of one or two weeks or two months, then things can be different compared to someone who is writing code in python for one year. Same we see, if somebody knows only array and loops and conditional logic, he may not be very prepared to learn data structures using C, because lot of data structures demand that you must know structure, pointer, memory allocation, all these things. So, I think we can consider all these things when we decide that okay, what should be the language we are going to use to teach data structures or algorithms, but mostly I find Python is a beautiful language except some edge cases that we need to be aware of and we need to 
discuss these things in the classroom with the students. So that is what I wanted to show you today and now if you have any question I would like to discuss more. Okay. Uh, do you think that if we write type uh, type hinted Python code, so is that a little bit helpful for the students? Because uh, with the example you showed in Python, it was unintuitive because the students didn't know what next was supposed to be or what the node is. So wouldn't it be better if like uh, we just showed the examples using type hinted Python? Maybe that would be a bit more. Yeah, that that would be better, I think, but. Whenever we are using something, most most of the time we are trying to use the basic version or regular version of the thing, right? So, okay, I think that's all. If no questions, thank you and thank you for having me here. <laughs>